Thank you. Am I on? You're on. Hello? There we go. Hi. I thought I'd just delay my coming up to the stage and just let you celebrate me a little bit longer. <laughs> this is so beautiful, isn't it? This building and being a part of this, uh, this first service here. And uh, I'm so, so excited for what's going on here. And uh, what a, a lot of work. And um, did we give it up for the worship team tonight too? That was a great new song. And how many of you are from other churches? Like this isn't your church, but you came here. Awesome. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, let's pray and we'll just see what we're going to do. You don't have a clock on the back wall. You got to do that too. <laughs> No clock is like telling your mechanic, I don't care what it costs. <laughs> so I'll watch my watch. Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you're doing here today. And we, we just pray for your presence just to uh, cover all of uh, the speaker's mistakes. Uh, Lord, we, just, we pray for you just to move powerfully in the room tonight. And for you to really um, instill us with encouragement and comfort. And uh, Lord, prod us to forward motion. And we pray that you would open up our eyes, that we'd see things we've never seen, that we'd hear things we've never heard, so we can be people we've never been and do things we've never done. Lord, I pray that nobody would leave here untouched. I pray that from the children in the children's church tonight to every adult, to even the sound man. Especially the sound man. Lord, don't get him drunk right now, though. Let's be really specific. <laughs> Turned me off, didn't you? Amen. I learned the hard way when I first started traveling that you want to be really kind to the host who invited you and to the sound man. And if you have to choose, it's the sound man. 100%. Wow. What is your name right there? Your chick in yellow. Yeah. Would you stand up, please? Uh, I saw the Lord, uh, I saw the Lord stabilize everything that's going on in your life. And I saw him just freeze all the challenges that you're going through that seem to have momentum. I saw the Lord just freeze them. And I saw him like reverse the tape and rerun it with a different outcome. And uh, you know, um, have you ever uh, watched a, a movie, like the movie Gladiator actually had a different outcome. You could go in the trailer and they, they actually had a, a different outcome that they, than, the, than the one we all saw. And I feel like the Lord's saying, the outcome that you've seen, there's a different outcome. And he's playing, he's playing the trailer of the new outcome for you. And it's, it's an outcome of success. And it's an outcome of beauty. And it's an outcome um, of, of comfort. And, um, and the Lord's taking the things that, went on in that in the other tape that was and he's actually going to reverse the those things and instead of being, things being taken away from you and stolen and uh, he's going to actually bring them back and also a, an inheritance that was given to someone else that should have been given to you that inheritance is going to come back to you with interest with interest the lord's bringing back interest and everything that's been robbed from you, the Lord is, is saying in the next 18, 19 months, the Lord's going to bring back the things that were taken from you, even things that were robbed from you a couple of years ago and that were never found. The Lord's going to bring those back. And you're going to be like, oh, that man's not a false prophet. <laughs> so I bless that in you in Jesus' name.
did uh, somebody have a dream? Uh, I think it was last night, uh, being on a, a ship in a storm. I just had this vision of uh, during worship. Did anyone have a dream like that? Would you raise your hand? No, nobody did. Everybody's like, I wish I did. <laughs> did you or what's that? Yes, you did. Oh, well, stand up. <laughs> what did you have it last night? Oh, okay, cool. All right, sit down. Thank you. <laughs> uh, stand. I'm sorry. I'm just being funny. So you can stand. I'm just being funny. I please stand. Sorry, I have a very sarcastic sense of humor. If you haven't, don't know that. Um, the Lord is calming the storms that you're in, and um, you know the enemy sent a storm to try to stop you from your destiny. Um, and the, I, I saw the Lord on there, on your fellowship, and He is uh, stopping the storm and releasing peace to you, and He's reconnecting you. And there's the season of reconciliation. It's a, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, 5, 18 and 19. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against him. And I believe that this is a, a season of reconciliation. For a broken relationship, that means it's meaningful to you, that the Lord's re- reconciling your relationship. He's reestablishing the, your, uh, your family line and lineage, and he's reestablishing, uh, he's reestablishing you as both uh, a woman of... of you are a woman of integrity and dignity, but he's reestablishing your, your uh, nobility and your reputation as a noble, godly woman. And there are gifts that are flowing out of you. And I, I saw the Lord put a leadership mantle on you for, uh, for the seasons ahead. And sometimes uh, Paul said, forgetting what lies behind and pressing forward through the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And sometimes the enemy brings up our past to to, uh, for, uh, so that he can, un, he can chain us to regret. And the Lord said that uh, he's breaking the chains of regret and he's accelerating you into your divine future. So I, I just release that over you in Jesus' name. And uh, don't be surprised if you get a phone call in the next few days from uh, somebody that you've hoped would reconcile with you. And so I just bless you in Jesus' name. I'll maybe do a little bit more of that. Um, What time are we actually supposed to be done? Can you tell me? No, no, um, we have kids. 9.30 is when the kids... The kids, okay, we're going to have... Okay, good, that's a lot of time. Um, I I want to share a prophetic word that I gave to our church and because this, you guys are part of this, uh, our family, and I think it's also... uh, I think it's also timely for what we're doing this tonight and this weekend in this whole uh, establishing, or I would say reestablishing um, this, this uh, move of God in Austin. Um, our, and our little, a little bit of our current history is that uh, we, obviously we've been through COVID together. We're still kind of coming out of it. <laughs> we're in California Hey, give me some sympathy. (laughs) We love our governor a lot. We pray for him all the time. And uh, on a serious note, we we, and uh, I was born in California, and all my kids were my grandkids. By the way, I I have a, you know, maybe you don't know me, but I've been married 46 years. We have, yeah, it's a miracle, huh? It's a. If you met my wife, you know that I'm a martyr. <laughs> Not at all. Um, and we have uh, four kids and, and 10 grandkids, almost 11. We're, we have 11 grandkids, one on the way, and we have a great grand, a grandson. And um, we, uh, you know, we were born in California, so um, this is, that's our land. That's our promised land. This is a, no matter what happens there, nobody gets to run us out of our promised land. Um, so you know, we, we've, we've had the same issues that you guys have had with COVID. And, and then our uh, senior uh, pastor's wife, Benny, uh, was, was diagnosed with four-stage cancer about, I don't know, seven months ago or something. So I've been going through treatments. And uh, the, uh, the same week that Benny was diagnosed, 
our senior pastors, Eric and Candace uh, Johnson, um, moved, uh, moved to Greenville, South Carolina, to plant the church. So we've been through a little bit of transition, uh, <laughs> very much of an understatement. And so we, we've been in this situation where we're just, you know, kind of waiting to restructure. And, uh, and we, so I started these meetings probably about, yeah, probably about seven months ago, eight months ago. And we're also, we also just started a college, which will be um, in 13 months, we'll have our own accreditation. So we're really excited about that. And so I, I gathered uh, some of our leaders, about 72 of our leaders together to talk about this transition, kind of people from every uh, different, we, ha we have about uh, 70 different um, divisions of our, of our organization. So I gathered them together and it was just like the, the first time we all got in a room to talk through where are we going and how are we gonna get there. And in my notes, I had um, the obvious talk about transition. And when I got up to say, uh, you know, we're going through a transition, uh, the Lord said to me, um, you're not going through a transition, you're going through a metamorphosis. And I was like, all right, that just messed up my whole notes. <laughs> and the Lord began to talk to me as I was sharing with our teams the Lord said to me, you're not going through a transition, you're going through a metamorphosis. And he said, transitions when you go from one season to another, but metamorphosis is not about changing seasons, but about changing you. And, uh, and from that moment, seven months ago or six or however long ago it was, uh, to this day, the Lord's been just unfolding this whole thing about metamorphosis. And of course, I think probably the same picture you get in your mind when I use the word metamorphosis is the caterpillar to the butterfly and I kind of left that meeting and did a little bit of research for the, uh, in the in the metaphor itself, and you know the caterpillar uh, is in the cocoon for about two weeks, and it liquefies before it uh, becomes a butterfly. And um, I really feel like, and at first I thought I was just carrying that word for our own teams, and as uh, over the next couple of weeks, I began to have this conversation with many other leaders around the nation and realizing that we're actually going through a metamorphosis. We're actually going through uh, a time of not just seasonal change, but personal trend, uh, personal, uh, a, a personal metamorphosis, a personal change in ourselves and a corporate change in who we are and how we do ministry. And um, Isaiah 42, nine says, the former things have come to pass Behold, I proclaim new things to you. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise to the end of the earth. Now, I, I believe Isaiah is an interesting uh, guy. In, in like lots of prophets, Isaiah uses a lot of metaphors as a way to communicate truth. And sometimes many of his metaphors, in my mind at least, have more than one dimension. Like, I believe God is so brilliant. He can say, he can give you the same verse he gives me, and it could have a completely different meaning to you than it has to me. Like God is multidimensional. And um, it's interesting, that, as a side note, it, it's interesting how we view the person of God. Because we say, like, God's in a good mood, or God's not, and people are like, God, how could God be in a good mood when there's this going on, there's that going on, there's this crazy thing happening, and, and you know, how many know that God has a personal relationship with you? Well, he's having a personal relationship with me. He's, had, he, he's, he's given a prophecy through this man while well, he's comforting this man, when he's doing a word of knowledge through that woman. You know, this is the, this is the challenge the Greeks had because they, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, where, where Paul is talking about um, how the spirit world works. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, the word gifts isn't actually in the text. Now, concerning the spiritual brethren, I don't want you to be unaware. And he begins to tell them that there are many gifts, but one God. That there are, there are many manifestations, but one Lord. That there are, and he goes on and he uses the word one eight times. One, one, one. Because the Greeks had a hard time understanding that that, that each gift isn't actually a different God. One God is multitasking, and he is having a relationship with, at this point, almost, almost close to eight billion people on the planet simultaneously. He's weeping with this one while he's rejoicing with this one. He, he, is, he is correcting that one where he's, 
where he is exhorting this one, and he's doing that all at the same time. Like, think about it. God's mind has to be has to be more brilliant than the greatest supercomputers that have ever been designed or developed. Like, God can have a person a personal relationship with billions of people, and we don't even know what creatures he has on the other on other planets. So I believe when Isaiah speaks, or when the when the Bible speaks. You know, and actually, even when we are preaching, you know, how do you preach one word that touches, in this case, I don't know, three or 400 people in the room? You come to hear something for you, but everybody else came to hear something specific, specifically for them, and yet one word can satisfy everyone in the room. Yeah. And so when Isaiah says, the former things that come to pass, behold, I proclaim new thing to you, a new thing to you, sing to the Lord a new song. I don't think he's just talking about singing. I think he's, I think he's using the word sing to mean think like a new, I'm doing a new thing and it's gonna require a new way of thinking. Like he's using song to depict a metaphor for thinking. <laughs> Am I making any sense at all? And I, I'm saying that God's not doing the next thing, God's doing the new thing. If God was doing the next thing, the, the former thing would have something to do with the next thing. But God didn't say, hey, the former things have come to pass. Behold, I'm doing the next thing. He didn't say next thing. He said new thing. And I believe that the Lord is doing a new thing, not just in Austin, Texas, but I do believe that this building is a prophetic declaration, especially the timing of this building is a prophetic declaration that God is not doing a, a next thing, that God's doing a whole new thing. In fact, Isaiah said later on, if I told you about it, you wouldn't even believe it. And I, I believe that God wants to do exceedingly abundantly, get this, more than you ask or think. So if you ask it or thunk it, he wants to do more than that. <laughs> Are you with me? And I, this is a bill quote. So if you, have to, if, you, if you have to have a God you understand, then you can't have an experience that God, in which God takes you to things you've never asked for. I think God wants to take us beyond our understanding. Amen. That's a good word, actually. Yeah. <laughs> when uh, Jesus said to the Pharisees, John, well, I, I'm, ad, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sort of ad-libbing this, but John sang the dirge, and you didn't mourn. I played the flute, and you didn't dance. He's depicting two epoch seasons. John sang the dirge, that's the funeral song. And you didn't mourn. I played the flute and you didn't dance. The flute is the wedding song. He, he's saying to the Pharisees, you weren't congruent with any season. You know, Behold the former things have come to pass. Behold I proclaim a new thing to you. Sing to the Lord a new song. The question is, what time is it and what song are you singing? When the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River in the first heaven, the first heaven, you know, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1. The second heaven, Ephesians chapter 6. There are principalities and powers, world forces of, of darkness in heavenly places. How many know there's no demons in God's heaven? And then Paul, the apostle, said, I knew a man, really speaking of himself, who went to the third heaven and he saw things indescribable. How many of you know that we've been raised up and seated in heavenly places, not in the second heaven, in the third heaven, far above, get this, all principalities and powers and every name that's ever been named, not only in this age or realm, but also in the realm to come. Yeah. What I'm getting at is that we live in the first heaven and we also live in the third heaven. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The word new there is prototype, never before created. When you receive Jesus Christ, you actually became a new species of creature in which you are... You, you have, the, as far as we know, we are the only creature that has the ability to live on earth and in heaven simultaneously. Yeah, are, are you following me? Yeah. So when the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River in the, in the first heaven, in the visible realm, uh, not just the visible, but in this realm, because there are things in this realm that are in this realm, for instance, sound waves and TV waves that you can't see, yeah. but, they, but they are... They are the reality of this realm. When they crossed over the Jordan River in the first heaven, they crossed over 
into a new epoch season. Epoch means a way in which God deals with his certain people in a certain time. They crossed over the Jordan River. They crossed over the Jordan River in the first heaven. They crossed into a new epoch season in the third heaven in which God dealt with the same people differently. For example, before they crossed the Jordan River, they had manna for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like all they had for food was manna except for a little time with quail. And they had a supernatural weather system, fire by night, cloud by day. Are you with me at all? Am I boring the crap out of you? But when they crossed over the Jordan River, the supernatural weather system ceased and the supernatural food system ceased. I'd like to suggest that the supernatural can keep you in, your, in the wilderness. <laughs> if you're unwilling to grow up, instead of having the supernatural happen to you, when they crossed the Jordan River, the supernatural went from happening to them to happening through them. There was no longer any more manna. Think about this for just a minute. By the way, I'm not saying the supernatural goes away. I'm saying it has a new application. And sometimes we, we, are, we, get, we camp around the manifestation. <laughs> we canonize the manifestation. Like this is what it looks like when God moves. Wow. And then we have Solomon. <laughs> when, so, when, the, when the Spirit of God comes on Solomon, he doesn't shake. He doesn't fall down. He gets smart. You're not listening, but. <laughs> when the spirit of the Lord comes on Samson, he doesn't get smart. He stays dumb. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? But he becomes strong. He's like physically strong. When the spirit of the Lord comes on Elijah, he can outrun a chariot. I'm saying sometimes we, 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 we camp around one manifestation and God wants to do a new thing and we're like, and, and listen, God wants to do a new thing and we're afraid of losing the old thing. Yeah. Metaphorically speaking, we go out every day to gather manna, but there's no manna. Think about this for a minute. I mean, this is true. Do you know that all, except for two people, except for Caleb and Joshua, when the children of Israel went across the Jordan River, and the manna ceased. It was the only time in the history of those people living. Because remember, all of their parents died off that came out of Egypt. The only thing they knew is manna. They never had to go look for food. It was brought to them, angel food. When they crossed the Jordan River into the promised land, the supernatural food system dried up. And you can imagine the first, you know, they had fasted before so in the wilderness. So you can imagine for the first six days, they're like, oh, we're on a seven-day fast. <laughs> you know, then they're on a 14-day fast. And about day 15, they're on a 21-day fast. And I, I think like about day 42, I think that Mary turns to Joel and says, you need to get a job. <laughs> and he said, what's a job? That's why they put the book of job in the Bible. <laughs> you know, the greatest, the greatest resistor of the new thing are people who succeeded in the old. See, if you were the gold medal Olympic manna gatherer in the wilderness, <laughs> you don't want the manna to cease. Because oftentimes we get our identity from what we do instead of who we are. So the greatest resistor of the new thing is often people who succeeded in the old. It's very true of religions. We tend to persecute the next move of God. <laughs> are you with me? Can I say you just crossed over the Jordan River and you need a new song? Like you need a new way of thinking because you're in a new season. And the challenge for all of us is gonna be this. We want to take what we learned in the wilderness and apply it to the promised land, but the Lord changed the conditions. 
uh, kind of an exalt illustration would be, uh, if we stay with that metaphor, would be, hey, we just trust God, the man is coming. God's like, no, go work. <laughs> Here's land, cultivate the gland. Here's houses. Oh, don't worry, it's, the heat is gonna go away soon, the cloud will come. No, build shelters. Uh, I'm saying sometimes we think we're undoing the work of God because God requires us to think differently. Wow. Now we have to go out and get our food. Now we have to build shelters. Now, now there's no supernatural anything. And then, you know, our theme song is the way we were. <laughs> and we start telling each other stories about when God moved. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to tell you about the next 18 months. This is the way, when God used to move, man, we were on the floor shaking. Oh man, we were shaking and baking. <laughs> Our meetings would go to two in the morning. That's so healthy. Six days a week. <laughs> we didn't have a family. <laughs> and this is a move of God. And now we have children. <laughs> we have to go to soccer games. help them with their homework. I remember when the Lord used to move when we stay up all night, not realizing that the Lord wants houses of acts and he didn't give us children, he gave us warriors in the hand, arrows in the hands of warriors. Revivalists are growing up in our home, but because we only see one manifestation of God, we don't realize that this is actually a greater glory to glory move but because I'm not on the floor shaking, I think God stopped moving. And then the Lord moves in the congregation, no one shakes, and Johnny gets smart and invents a cure for cancer. And we're like, man, I remember when God used to move and heal the sick. You should write down what I'm telling you. <laughs> this is not a teaching. Wow. <coughs> Do you hear me? Yeah. You, in the stripes, stand up. The Lord is doing a new thing in you. You can feel it, right? Your heart is burning, right? You can feel it, like the Lord is doing a whole new thing in you. Like what you did has nothing to do with what you're gonna do. And by the way, don't be surprised if the Lord uses you in the thing you said you'd never do. Oh. <laughs> you following me? When you tell the Lord, I'll never do that, the Lord's like, he's, he loves competition. <laughs> in fact, what I've figured out with the Lord after all these years of following the Lord, I'm like, when I don't wanna do something, I'm like, Lord, please let me do this thing. <laughs> <laughs> but don't be surprised if the Lord used you in what you think is your weakness because where you're weak and when you're weak he is strong and the Lord is going to establish you as a great leader and I see people gathering around you and I see you teaching them and I see the things you say oh man this just creates anxiety when I'm in front of people and the Lord's like well get used to the promised land and I'd like to say with Joyce Myers Joyce Myers book sitting on my nightstand I only read the title <laughs> do it afraid because the dogs of doom stand at the doors of your destiny and the Lord's been trying to chase you I mean the Lord the devil's been trying to chase you out of your destiny since you were five years old and the Lord's like kick him in the teeth and move forward because it's time for you to take the promised land, it's time for you to move in, in power and it's time for you, like to, for the beautiful brain that you have to be exposed to the world. You have a great mind. And so I just remove mental blocks and any, any kind of esteem issues that would say that I'm not, I'm not smart because the Lord says, actually you're brilliant. And so I bless what God's doing in you. So the Lord's doing a new thing. The Lord's doing a new thing and it's gonna require a new song. It's gonna require a new way of thinking. 
when, uh, on the, uh, when I got out of the airport in Austin um, and I was um, you know, looking for uh, the exit, trying to figure out how to get out of there, I looked down, <laughs> I know, I was like, I'm, I was led by the spirit, but it was the wrong one. I went the wrong way. <laughs> and I looked down and there was someone's wallet there on the ground. So I picked it up and I opened it up. There was no money or anything in it. It was just the lady's identification card. And so I, oh, okay. So I, I went and handed it to the airline st steward there and said, hey, I found this. She, so, and then about... I maybe went from here to the parking lot and I found and someone else dropped something and it was one of those neck pillows. It was brand new. It still had the tag on it. And it was like, that's weird. I found two things in one day. I've been flying forever. never found anything. <laughs> but I've lost a bunch of stuff. I lost a, an iPad. I forgot my iPad on the plane 10 years ago and a pervert picked it up and sent naked pictures of his anatomy to all, every, every woman on my, yeah. Every woman on, on, on my uh, contact list for months. Yeah, yeah, well, in my name. Yeah, it's like, uh, Chris called me today. Hey, that weren't mine. <laughs> Let me be clear, that had nothing to do with me being transparent. <laughs> so I have lost some things before, but I have never found anything. Anyway, I, I believe the Lord is restoring some people's identity that's been lost. You lost it on, in your journey in the airport. In your journey and I believe the Lord wants to comfort some people yeah. he wants to be your comforter if you're going through tragedy right now would you stand I'm sorry I'm interrupting my message so many times I don't usually preach like this but if you if you're in the middle of a tragedy would you just stand please I feel like we're supposed to comfort people who are in the middle of a tragedy yeah there's somebody right over here though would you please stand thank you is there anyone else? Some of you aren't. My tragedy is I'm a f I have social anxiety. I don't stand in front of people. <laughs> stand anyway, please. Would you just put your hands out to these people right now? Because uh, I believe that before you get all the way home tonight, that the Lord is going to have solved many of the issues that you are afraid of. And I, I, I mean, I, I've never, I don't think I've said that before, that I remember at least, but Lord, I release the angels that they would be on the assignment of these people who are in the midst of tragedies. Yeah. That you would comfort them, that you would solve some of their, the issues. The children would come home, they would be off of drugs, husbands and wives would, would uh, reconcile. The finances would be solved money would come in. Lord, I just bless what you're doing right now and these people in Jesus' name. I, if you're standing, I want you to say, I receive it for myself. And I want you to do this. I want you to close your eyes for a minute, those of you that are standing, and I want you to imagine what it would look like if what you're in the midst of ended well. End it well, right now. End it well. Some of you have lost a loved one. You're like, it would look like the Lord gave me peace or my family peace or whatever. Some of you have uh, something you need to happen. Thank you, Lord. All right, you can sit down. Thank you so much. The Lord's doing a new thing. Um... In our meetings, um, the second meeting or third meeting we had, these, these meetings, we began to call them the as one meetings. And the Lord moved so powerfully that, like I was doing, you know, a strategic planning meeting 
and the Holy Spirit fell on people and they began to fall and weep and apologize and repent to one another. Not, there wasn't, I mean, I didn't orchestrate it. They just, someone got up and said, one, you know, these 72 leaders, and we're talking about the Lord doing a, a, a new thing. The Lord is, there, there's a metamorphosis going on. We're moving from caterpillar to, to butterfly. We're being attached not to the, to the earth, but to the heavens. And while, while I'm just sharing that, someone says, one of our teams, prominent member of our team, uh, said, can I, can I say something? So, yeah, sure, go ahead. And he stands up and he said, I haven't been a good leader. I have resented many of you in this room. And I'm like, whoa, where's this going? <laughs> and people start weeping in the room. And he's like, would you please forgive me? And there was a chorus of, of course, and then someone else got up and said, I've, I've had the same issue. And I'm like, uh, this is a strategy meeting. <laughs> Put your heart away and let's stay in our heads. <laughs> and they began to repent to one another. And, being th they, and you know, before the meeting was over, there wasn't a dry eye in the place. People weeping and sharing with one another and talking with one another. It was... I was like, okay, Lord, this wasn't on the notes, but it's okay, as long as you don't do it often. <laughs> a few weeks later, we were having another as one meeting, and I, got, I'd been, I had been getting up at like five in the morning, and the meetings were at 10, just to prepare, not just the notes, but like, Lord, what are you doing? Where are we going? And the night before, I had been watching Elon Musk uh, videos about <laughs> SpaceX and going to Mars. Sorry if you don't like Elon Musk. Like, he's not my idol or anything like that, I want you to know. Like, I don't think he's a believer, but he, he doesn't know God, but God knows him. Yeah. I just like the way he thinks, you know? Like, it's, I mean, I was watching an interview that this guy was interviewing him, and he asked him the question, like, how did you come up with, like, this Hyperloop system that you want to build in L.A.? He says, oh, well, I was in traffic stuck in traffic and then I started thinking about a hyperloop system with seven levels and he goes on to explain it you know and I'm like when I'm in traffic I think what's on the radio <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like I've got to hang around people that actually think <laughs> so I'm listening to this whole thing on spa uh, space and why is he wants to go to the moon and all this stuff in it uh, you know, I, I listened to two or three videos before I went to bed. So I woke up in the morning and I had this whole idea of rocket in my mind. So I don't want to say it's the Lord because I was listening to Elon Musk videos in the night. But uh, as I was praying for our, our morning, I had this picture, uh, this video running in my mind. I, I hesitate to call it a vision from the Lord because, again, I, I might have just been an inspired imagination. And in the, in the, and, and it was, uh, it was, the, it was a video in my mind. It was a, the image of the moon launch, uh, the Apollo 11 moon launch. I was a young man, young boy, when the, when we, when the Apollo uh, 11 landed on the moon. And so I went uh, in YouTube, and I went on YouTube, and I looked up a bunch of the uh, videos of the Apollo 11. There's all kinds of videos of the, of the, of the moon launch. And I just was watching them early in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, just watching his moon launch. And I, and I, I just got so inspired. I'm like, this is amazing. And, uh, and then I decided that, and I felt like the Lord was talking to me through this moon launch. So I, uh, I took the, there's a four and a half minute video of it. And so I took that video and I took it to the As One meeting. And it was a great big screen TV set up. And I didn't tell anybody what I was doing but I got it all set up so I could play the video on the screen and turn the sound way up before they came in and had it all queued up. And so they walk in, you know, 70 of them, they walk in, they're doing what we always do, you know, talking uh, kind of as they find their seats and stuff. And, and I kind of, I didn't say anything to anybody, I just waited till they all got seated. And then I hit the button and all of a sudden <laughs> the screen shows up with this, you know, here we are, here another moon launch. Paul 11, and there's a, you know, the, the, there's an orator in the background, you know, and we're just a few, you're just a few minutes away from the moon launch, and they're all like, <laughs> the old man is cracked. <laughs> He's lost his mind. 
And so, uh, and then so, you know, it kind of fast, it kind of goes through the, you see, uh, you probably have seen some of these videos, right? There, the, uh, the where, where did, did it launch from here? Houston, yeah, Houston. And so, uh, yeah, that's right, it doesn't say Austin. It says Houston. <laughs> we have lived off Houston. <laughs> it's all these scientists and engineers in this room about this size, right? And there's, they're all wearing white coats, and they're, and they're watching on this huge screen this, the rocket beginning to take off. And then it's like 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We have liftoff. We have liftoff. And everybody stands up and they're cheering and yelling. And, you know, they've been working on this for years, right? Trying to get this rocket up. And, and I'm watching this rocket. And everyone's watching this rocket. And the room's kind of rattling with, because <laughs> I have it up too loud. And, and, you know, they're like, what is going on? What is he doing? And so the rocket leaves the atmosphere. And it's like, we have takeoff. We have liftoff. We've... And then it leaves the atmosphere and it heads into the stratosphere and, and, then, uh, and then the thrusters fall off and it says, the thrusters have fallen off, they're down, they're down, the thrusters are down. And, and it goes, then the rocket goes onto the stratosphere and, and, the, and the video's over. So they're like, so I come to the podium. I have their attention now. I said, what's our moon and what has to fall off so we can get there? Because I said to them, I feel like we just left the atmosphere and we headed in the stratosphere. And the thing that got us out of the atmosphere, the thrusters, the thrusters have dispensed their fuel and they no longer have a purpose except for to weigh us down. What must we shed so that we can navigate the next level? in Christ because we just left caterpillar and we're moving towards butterfly and I'm concerned that we've canonized things that were actually structural and it was about that response <laughs> and I, I was thinking about Hebrews 12 1 Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. I want to, you know, there's a bunch more there, but I, 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 I didn't notice until the next day. I didn't even use this verse in there. But I didn't notice till the next day that it wasn't just sins that entangle us, but also encumbrances. Encumbrances are weights and agreements that we make. It means bulk or mass with things and people, organizations and identities. Like, is it possible, you're like, I'm not living a life of sin, but are you encumbered to the place that where you're going, <laughs> because of where God's taken you, maybe you have to let go of some things. Is it possible that there are people in your life that are keeping you from your promise and purpose? Think about this. Caleb and Joshua were faithful to God, but because of their family and friends, they were 40 years delayed from, becoming, from coming into their promised land because they refused to go without these people. And I'm saying sometimes you're supposed to stay with your people, but sometimes you've got to let the dead bury the dead. There's, a, there's an interesting contrast. I believe that all truth is held in tension. In fact, I teach our students, if... If you, if, if before you go make decisions on scripture, make sure you know what the t scripture intention is, intention. Because Jesus said to the Pharisees, you say, give everything, you, you call the blessing of God Corbin, and you give it all to the, basically to the church. And you leave nothing for your parents, and therefore you have broken the commandment honor your mother and father. You don't give any money to your parents. You only give it to the temple. And therefore, you've dishonored your mother and father. And, and, and so Jesus teaches us to honor our mother and father. He comes to a man, and he said, follow me. And the guy says, please let me go bury my mother, my father. And he said, let the dead bury the dead. <laughs> do I honor them, or do I bury them? Do I honor them, or do I leave them? And what I'm getting at is that there are times for one thing and there are seasons for another. <laughs> and what I'm getting at is there are people 
I feel from the Spirit I'm supposed to say this. There are people in your life that you've poured into for years that have made no positive progress, but they've keeping you from your promised land. And you've, in the last months, you've realized that these people are never going to change because they don't want to change. But what they have done is they keep me from changing. They've kept me out of my, my promised destiny, and they've become to me an encumbrance. They've become to me a people who refuse to move forward. And I am, I need to shed those people. Now, let me be, I know that sounded really harsh. We should love everybody. We should love our enemies. Make sure you have some. Some of you don't have enemies because you're not doing anything worth resisting. Second thing I want to say is choose your enemies well. <laughs> Jesus said, love your, you should choose your enemies. Like, I don't want people to be mad at me because of my stance on a COVID virus. If, you're, if, that's, your, if that's your mountain, awesome. Die on it. But don't take me with you. <laughs> no, I'm not making a statement about the virus. I'm making a statement about I don't want to die for things that you have a passion for, but I don't. I don't have an enemy on that mountain on either side. I don't have a, I, I, listen, I, I don't have, I'm Switzerland. <laughs> I'm vaccinated and I'm not an evangelist for it. So if you want to die on that mountain, die on that mountain. Don't take me with you. Because I, I, I don't want to die on that mountain. I have mountains the Lord's given me to die on. And you maybe say, I don't want to die on that mountain. Yeah. That's great. But that's what I want to give my life for. So I'm saying, choose your enemies well. Yeah. So people write me and they're like, you're the anti-vax person. <laughs> don't include me. Because I am not. <laughs> you're the pro vax type. Oh, no, I am not. <laughs> I'm the leave me alone. <laughs> Be angry with me for other things. Some of us have encumbrances with people. And we should love everybody, and we should love, love our enemies, and we should pour into the poor. And we should give to people who can't give back to us. And I think nobility, I think nobil nobility is measured by what you do to people who can't reciprocate. Yeah. How you treat people who have no recourse determines if you're really noble. I want you to know, I believe all that. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people that get into our influence circle. And they move us away from the will of God. And they get between us and God. And we have to, we have to move them outside of that circle and say, I'm going to serve God rather than you. Because serving you is taking me out of serving God. Some of you are in jobs that you live a secure life. But it's almost like prostitution. Because you're working in a job that God told you to leave a long time ago, but because it pays a lot of money, you can't leave. I've never told this story publicly, but I was on a plane with a lady. Kathy and I were on a plane with this, we on a plane with a lot of people. <laughs> But for some crazy reason, this was many years ago, we were sitting in the cattle seats and, and, and in economy. And Kathy got assigned one seat and I got assigned another and there was a lady in between us. And you know, normally we'd just say, can you move over, whatever, can we switch seats? But when we sat down and, I, and we saw the lady in between us, I just, I just felt like the Lord put her there. And so we took off and she was a very beautiful woman and she looked to like she was, she was dressed as if she was wealthy. And so we're, um, so we, get, we take off and we're, we're, we fly for just a few minutes and then you know how you, it's when you're that tight, it kind of feels awkward to not at least introduce yourself, you know. <laughs> so I turned to her and I said, hey Mary, what do you do for a living? And she said, how did you know my name was Mary? <laughs> it didn't occur to me until I said Mary that she, we hadn't had any conversation <laughs> so that she instantly thought I was stalking her <laughs> and she's like how did you know my name is Mary I said well, well uh, and, 
And Kathy steps in and says to her, uh, well, he has this gift from God. And she's like, oh yeah, that, you know, she's looking at, right. <laughs> and then she asks again, how, how did you know my name was Mary? And I, I just, and I was like, what do I say to like calm her down? <laughs> so Kathy was trying to calm her down, you know? So we're, so, so now we're flying. I'm like, I better, wow, wow, this is really high tension. <laughs> so we're flying for a few more minutes and, and the Lord gives me this word for her. And I said, so your husband's ahead of a tech company. Now she's totally freaked out. <laughs> How do you know that? And so then Kathy's trying to like, he's kind of like, kind of like God gives him things and she's like she is not doing God's giving him things. And she, now she's like, she's sweating and she's nervous and I think she's gonna call the stewardess. And she's like, how do you know that? And I said, well, the, you know, the Lord gave me this picture of you and, and I said, you grew up poor. And so she's like, yeah, and this is the house you grew up in, yeah. Yes, that's right. She's starting to cry. And, and I said, um, so your husband, um, right before you left, you, you got a call from a woman and she said wrong number and hung up, right? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So you think your husband's home alone, right? Isn't he? No, you know he's not. You know he's not. And you know that this is the third one in the last six months. But you don't leave him. And you don't confront him. And you know why you don't? She, now she's in tears. I have no idea. Because you grew up poor, and now you're wealthy, and you like the money. Even though you don't trust him. And then on the floor she was. Kathy ministered to her the rest of the time. It just reminds me of encumbrances in which we do things for money, even though we know that what we're doing isn't the Lord, and we make up stories about why we stay there. I've never told the story publicly, not one time. But the Lord wants us to break encumbrances with things, and we ha we've told ourselves this is a better life, but I want to promise you that the Lord has a much better life. And that, here's what's going to happen. When you go home and break that encumbrance, three months from now, you're going to say, I don't know why I didn't do that 10 years ago. Wow. I don't know why I didn't do that three years ago. I don't know why I didn't break my relationship. I don't know why I didn't quit that job. I don't know why. And by the way, I'm not a quit job guy. So this is a word of the Lord. Like some of you are in jobs that's almost like prostitution. I'm not talking about sexual or anything like that. I'm talking about the fact that you, you, you like the money, but you know you're out of the will of God. And the Lord's like, trust me, get out of the boat and follow me and see what I'll do for you because I have something for you that you never thought or asked. And you think you're living the good life, but I'm gonna tell you, I have planned a life for you that you've never even dreamed of. And if you will trust me, I will give you a life that you, that you never dreamed of, that's better than you ever thought of, that's better than anyone you know has, and it'll include finances if you trust me. Wow. I remember um, this gal, we were on prayer lines, this is probably 10 years ago, we were praying for people on prayer lines, and uh, this, uh, this servant, uh, one of those prayer servants came over and said, hey, this lady wants to talk to you. So I went over, I uh, saw this lady. She was dressed in a business suit. Another very nice looking lady, probably in her mid-40s. And uh, she said to me, uh, hi, is your name Chris? I said, yeah. She said, my friend told me to talk to you. And I said, okay. She said, I'm a psychic. I've been trained by the psychic network. And I said, okay. I mean, just like matter of factly, like I'm a psychic. I said, okay. She said, my friend told me to talk to you. She was a psychic too. I said, Okay. Uh, you know how you're like, okay, where is this going, right? And what are you doing here standing on a prayer line? You just endured the message and the worship. And she said, so I, I, I'm tormented, and I haven't slept in years. And my friend was too, and she said she came here and you helped her. I, I, to this day, I have no idea who that was. This is like a mass deliverance or something. I said, okay. She said, so... So can you help me? 
sure. So I said, um, so you have a spirit guide, right? She said, yes. And she said, oh, I forgot to tell you this part. She works for, and I, I won't tell you the company, but you would absolutely know the name of the company, a large tech company. And she said, I, I'm on staff as a psychic, and I give them, uh, I give them uh, words about the future. I'm on the consulting team. It's a super matter of fact, like no conviction that what she's doing is wrong or evil or anything. So I said, okay, so you have a spirit guide, right? And she said, yeah. I said, so while she's telling me that, the Lord says, no, she has two spirit guides. I said, you have spirit, two spirit guides and they both have a man's voice, right? She said, yeah. I said, okay, well, those spirit guides are demons. She looked like I ran over her with a truck. She said, they're what? I said, they're demons. She said, they're demons? I said, yeah, you think they're your friend, but they're actually two demons. And actually, they're the ones tormenting you at night. She said, you're kidding. I said, no, I'm not. She said, okay. I said, so I can make them leave and the torment will stop. And she said, they told me to tell you they don't like you. I said, tell them I don't like them either. <laughs> she said, they said to tell you they know. <laughs> so she said, so you will make them leave. I said, yeah. And then you'll have to ask Jesus into your life and ask the Holy Spirit into your life so that those two demons don't come back. She said, my friend told me that you did that for her. Like this girl has no Bible background at all. My friend told me that that's what she did. You told her she had to do that. I said, okay. So I said, do you want me to pray for you? She said, okay. And then she goes, if those, what'd you call them? I said, demons. If those demons leave, am I going to be able to tell the future? Now, I know the answer is the Holy Spirit will give you a gift, right? But the Holy Spirit told me to tell her no. She, I said, no. She said, so what you're saying is that if I, if I let you pray for me, that my spirit guides will leave and I won't know the future. I said, that's right. She said, well, what will I do for a living? I said, well, you can either be tormented and rich or poor and broke. <laughs> she said, okay, let me think about it. <laughs> Just like that. So I started to walk away thinking she's gonna come back or think about it. And she closed her eyes and she goes, okay, I'd rather be poor and peaceful. <laughs> poor and peaceful is what I said. So anyway, so I prayed for her. She went down on the ground. She got delivered, got filled with the Holy Spirit. She's rolling on the floor, laughing hysterically. <laughs> like the joy of the Lord just overcame her. She's like, this is amazing. Oh my gosh, my friend had the same experience. <laughs> she gets off the floor. She hugs me like we knew each other forever. I said, hey, you need to get to good church. She goes, yeah, my friend told me he told her that too. I'm gonna go to her church. That's such a great example of a woman who had to decide if she was going to be poor and peaceful. And by the way, I don't think those were the two options, but those are the two options the Lord gave her in the moment. Like, will you leave everything to follow me? And I wasn't able to tell her the rest of the story. Probably God will return to you. Probably the Lord will give you a gift, probably. But the Lord said, no, let her count the cost of following me. And I feel like the Lord, by the way, this is not my, no, I'm on page one of my notes. I have <laughs> 17 pages. I didn't plan, I haven't told this story publicly either. Oh, I have to the students once that I remember. Well, I just feel so strongly that the Lord is calling people to leave your comfort zone and come into the throne zone. That the Lord has a much better plan than your plan. And that you're trying to include the Lord in your plan and the Lord's like, let your plan go and let's do my plan. Because my plan is a butterfly and yours is a freaking caterpillar. And you think that you should stay connected to that branch, but the Lord's like, I'm telling you, this is, I'm not, I'd not share this, even with my own team. The Lord says, come fly with me. 
Come fly with me. Come and have a new identity with me. Come into your identity and I will comfort you. Come to the airport with me and fly with me. And not only will you fly, but I'll give you a new identity. You'll get rid of that caterpillar. I'm nobody, I'm nothing. I always feel small and I envy everything that's beautiful and flies. And the Lord's like, come with me and I'll take you on a flight you've never thought of. You've never, listen, here's the emphasis tonight. The plan God has for you, he's never revealed to you because of where your heart is. You want to stay connected to the boat. The Lord only wants to talk to you about his vision for you when you get out. The Lord's like, come over here, get out of the boat and come with me and I'll tell you about what I plan I have for you. But not until you leave the boat, not knowing what else there is. Did you hear that? Like that lady, I know that God's going to bless that lady. I've lived for for more than 50 years with the Lord. I know you never leave anything without God giving you more. But I also know that he doesn't often tell you that he's going to give you more till you leave the thing that's holding you back. And I believe that not only are you going through a metamorphosis personally, and that was the emphasis tonight, but I believe that we are going through a metamorphosis corporately that corporately we're moving from a stereotype to a prototype. And that we are beginning to think, here's the last part, future present. Future present. Like the Lord is talking to us about letting go of what lies behind. We talked about the encumbrances, but not just the encumbrances. Like we need to let go of what lies behind and press forward to the upward call in God and Christ Jesus. The upward, the butterfly, like let's leave caterpillar thinking. I love this verse, let me find it, I'm stalling. Colossians says, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden in Christ. You have died. You have went through the metamorphosis. Are you with me? The, you, you know, it liquefies. You got baptized. You, got, you liquefied. And your life is hidden in Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, you'll be revealed with him in glory. In glory. Are you with me? So I, I believe the Lord wants to start, wants to start thinking future present as a mindset future present. Um, John, the uh, apostle in Revelation 4, Jesus says to John, come up here. Come up here. And I'll show you what must take place after these things. How many know our heavenly seat gives us eternal perspectives? So we see things not as they are, but as they should be. I believe the Lord wants to say, come up here. You're like, I don't want to be so heavenly minded. I'm no earthly good. I'm talking about being so heavenly minded. You're finally earthly good. <laughs> you know, being a caterpillar and counting your steps every day is not living. <laughs> Think about how many feet you have. It was supposed to be a little bit funny. <laughs> that didn't work. Uh, and, and you know uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ? Have you ever noticed the 16th verse, which I rarely hear anyone quote? The 16th verse says, we no longer know each other after the flesh. For we once knew Christ this way, but we know him no longer. Next verse, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, prototype. All things have passed away. The therefore, therefore, if any man be in Christ, is related to the previous verse which says, we no longer know each other after the flesh. And what I'm getting at is what would happen if this building was full of people who were getting to know each other after the Spirit. Not just getting to know the Spirit, but getting to know each other after the Spirit. And we began to relate to each other, if you will, follow me for a minute. If we began to relate to each other, if we said to each other, like if this was the upper room, are you with me? It's a little play on words. If this was the upper room and we had an uprising and we began to think and, and speak to each other and talk to each other, future present, because we discerned each other after the spirit and not after the flesh. 
So it's like, it doesn't matter what house you grew up in or the sins you committed, B.C. or even A.D., because the Lord has forgiven and washed them away. If you stop talking about what you're not good at and why you can't do it, and here's my failure, and here's the three businesses I got fired from, and here's the guy who broke up with me and the girl who didn't love me and the divorce I went through, and, and it's like, and, and what I'm getting at is we're, it, we're, it's not just incidents that we've had in our lives. I'm speaking to myself, but it is, it is become our identity. Hey, here's my wall. Look at my identity. And it says divorced, broken, businesses, bankrupt, nervous breakdown. And, and I want people to know my history because I so identify with my history. And God goes, come up here and let's know each other, not past present, but future present. And we start creating a culture an entire culture where people go, well, you know, I've been divorced. I'm like, hey, hey, listen, if it's a counseling session or you need empathy, I'm with you. But can we not identify each other from the worst things that have happened in our life, how our parents abused us, how we were raped, how we were molested. We all have our stories. Listen, I'm not trying to be, I don't, I don't mean there's never a time for that. I'm talking about identity. Like, I am not going to relate to you out of your brokenness. I'm going to relate to you out of his call on your life, and I'm going to begin to call you up into your, into your divine destiny. I don't want to know your caterpillar life. You already have been metamorphosized. You've been liquefied. You've been baptized and you've come out yeah. in Christ. Yeah. I want to know you're in Christ identity. I don't want to know you're in devil di identity. Yeah. <sighs> uh, this is, I've quoted this gal so many times. Her name is Allison Armadine. And her, I think she was in second year school ministry, the first, second year we ever had school ministry. And she said, I love to listen to other people's prophecies. I said, you like to listen to other people's prophecies? She said, yes. I said, why? She said, so I treat them not as they are, but as God sees them. And I begin to invite them into their purpose and destiny. Like, I believe that this, that this church, and I'm not talking about just in this walls right here. I'm talking about the church right now. I believe that the church is to raise up champions who are willing to die for something we're dying for. And by the way, some people are so needed... <laughs> Oh, gosh. Some people so need something to die for that you're dying for stupid. You're dying for things that don't matter to God. You're like, I'm going to give my life for that thing. It's like, well, you're giving your life for what? Your cosmetology? Your, your, you're giving your life for a job that's a dead end nowhere? Like, why don't you give your life for something that matters? Like, I want to use my energy for something that matters. And I'll tell you, I believe that this generation, I'm talking about the Zers and the Wires and the, uh, you know. And by the way, Z is not the last generation. It's the lost generation. I believe that God, and by the way, this whole generation is lost. Whether you're a baby banger boomer. <laughs> I believe that this generation is looking for something exciting enough to live for and important enough to die for. And I believe that this generation is the most, the most creative, brightest generation in the history of the world. And I think that we're siphoning off, and I, 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 this is, listen, I have no problem with video games, so what I'm about to say. I have no problem with entertainment. I love to go to the movies. If there was a good one, I'd go twice a week. <laughs> I go to bad ones just to eat popcorn. I just, something about <laughs> So, so, so what I'm about to say is not an indictment against entertainment unless I'm living a virtual life because I don't have an exciting enough reality life. And I'm siphoning off being a hero on a video game because my freaking life doesn't have anything worth living for. And I'm saying, what would happen if we created a culture where people come in as caterpillars and this place becomes the metamorphosis. It becomes the cocoon where people get ugly and then they get beautiful. And then we begin to not just have a prophetic words, but we begin to have a prophetic culture. You know the difference between a prophetic word and a prophetic culture? A prophetic word is like, you know, someone gives you word, it's like a seed, right? Jesus said the sower went out and sowed seed. The word seed, there's the word sperma. We get a word 
sperm from it. So it's like the words are like sperm. They're like seeds, right? And so it's like, I got, I, look at, here's all my prophetic words. I have them right here. I got them all written down, 50 of them. And I put them in my wallet and I carry them around. And, I, and then I wonder why they never happen. And I accumulate them to a place of frustration. I'm like, I don't know if I believe in prophecy anymore. But think about this. I'll end with this. I have five minutes. When Samuel encountered Saul, who would be later King Saul, he was looking for donkeys. Some of you are looking for donkeys. But if you don't go looking for your donkeys, you won't find your destiny. Like, like oftentimes you're fishing and you're like, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to go fishing. And Jesus meets you on the shore because he's least looking for someone who's working. I'm waiting on the Lord. He ain't that slow, dude. I don't know what to do. Go be responsible somewhere because he's going to find you at your place of responsibility and call you out of that boat. And so this guy is looking for donkeys and he runs into the prophet. This is a longer story. If you want to read it, it's 1 Samuel 9 and 1 Samuel 10. And, the, and he, they can't find their donkeys. And so his servant, the number two guy says to him, listen, why don't we go to this next city? I think there's a prophet there. Isn't it funny how the number two guy is often smarter than the number one guy? Yeah. And so anyway, so <laughs> this is a joke. You have to, <laughs> you got to be, you got to be in the, in, you got to be, a, it's a family joke. <laughs> and by the way, number two guy is not smarter than number one guy. It's just a joke. <laughs> Maybe there's a prophet up here. So Samuel, so they, they go to this house, which is Samuel's house, the prophet's house, but they don't know he's, he, they don't know it's his house or that he's the prophet. And he comes out and they said, hey, do you know where the seer is? Do you know where the prophet is? And he goes, I'm the prophet. And by the way, your donkeys, which you went to look for, which they didn't tell him about, have been found. But I want you to stay for tomorrow morning. I'm going to tell you all that's in your heart. I want you to get this, all that's in your heart. For aren't you the one that all of Israel's waiting on? And Saul says, why are you talking to me like this? For I am from the smallest family in the smallest tribe in all of Israel. Okay, follow me. I want to make a couple points before I end. Saul is from the smallest family in the smallest tribe. But he, what he didn't realize, what he didn't say, or what he didn't think of, his father, Saul's father, was the greatest, famous, most famous warrior in that time in history. I'm saying sometimes you hang, if your dad is famous, your mom is famous, instead of becoming a platform, it becomes a ceiling. And you're intimidated by the greatness of other people because you don't know who you are. So Samuel says, tomorrow morning, I'm going to tell you all that's already in your heart. You get this? It's in his heart to be king, but he doesn't know it. The next morning, he anoints him king. And he tells him to do these things, like go down to this place. You're going to see the prophets coming down from Bethel. Did you notice they're coming down from the mountain to Bethel? Okay, just thought... Established conference, Bethel. And then he tells them, like, here's what's going to happen. When he, he anoints him king, and he says, these prophets are going to be coming down from the mountains, going to Bethel, and you're going to join them. And when you join them, you're going to be, you're going to, the spirit of the Lord's going to come upon you, and you're going to become another man. And it says, as soon as he turned to go, he encounters the prophets, and he turns into another man, and he prophesies with the prophets. Um, he becomes, later on, he loses his connection with God. He becomes jealous, and he starts chasing David for 14 years in the wilderness. And two more times, the prophets come down from the mountains, encounter Saul, and the wicked, schizophrenic man turns back into the man he's supposed to be, rips his clothes, and prophesies with the prophets. Twice. And what I'm getting at is this, is that the prophetic word will tell you what's in your heart but it's the company of prophets that'll change you into the person you need to be so you can fulfill the word that God has in you. And I'd like to say that it's not just having a prophetic word, it's actually having people around you, that your prophetic community that causes the word, the, the word to germinate, if you will, to cocoon and to give birth. Did you get that? God never intended us to have individual identity that was removed from an interdependent identity because our identity is not 
sitting in a corner somewhere humming by ourselves. It's actually being a part of the other people that God is moving with. Okay, I need to be done because the kids are going to be going crazy. Would you stand? I believe I'm supposed to pray for courage. Because I believe that the Lord has put in many hearts tonight that there's a change. Some of it's just an, an attitude. Some of it is people that are in your inner circle need to be like moved from place of influence. Some of you need to st stop texting back. Ban people from calling you that you know are pulling you away. Like sometimes we have to make a hard line with people. Sometimes we even have to let kids that are just wanting to do their own thing and have no desire to do anything but disrupt our homes. Sometimes we just have to say to our adult kids, you just need to go figure it out with God because we are not the savior of the world. And sometimes we so love people that we think that somehow if they stay with us, that we'll save them. And sometimes it's letting them go into the hands of God that saves them. And finally saying, you can't stay here doing that. You can't stay here living like that. We'll be here. You know, the prodigal son's father did not turn the farm into a house of prostitution to woo the back boy back. He waited for him to repent. And sometimes we have to wait for our sons and daughters, our friends, our biological and our spiritual sons and daughters. Sometimes we have to wait. We have to let them go to the pig farm so they understand what it's like to have their way. And so I pray for wisdom and courage tonight. Can't remember ever preaching a message like this. I pray for wisdom and courage tonight because, Lord, you have something exceedingly abundantly more than we ask or think. And, Lord, I pray that you would give us courage to get out of the boat, to cut the umbilical cord that should have been cut at birth, to let go of the rope, to release that person, to build a boundary from the person who has ill intention and who we've become their savior instead of their messenger. Lord, I bless this people. These are brilliant people. And I pray over the next weeks that we would move to butterfly, that we would pick up our identity and find the comforter and we be on this journey in the spirit to know each other. After the spirit, we know each other future present and we would come into our divine identity and our divine assignment. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for listening.